I was sitting in my friend's spare bedroom and looking at my smartphone, which was connected to the security cameras of my apartment. I could hear the groans of the occupants of my bedroom and the creaks and groans of protest from my bed. It turned out that my bride was sandwiched between the best man and the groomsman, who, twelve hours earlier, were having fun with me at my bachelor party. On Friday, they took me to the Gold Coast in Queensland. Saturday was a day at the races, and then a big night at the casino. Sunday morning was spent lazily relaxing by the pool at the resort. Tom, my best man, and Carl, my groomsmen, said goodbye to us. They couldn't get time off from work on Monday, so they had to leave early to return to Sydney. Later in the afternoon, we were getting ready to head out again when we were visited by hotel security. One of the cleaners found a bag of pills. She called security, and they came and confiscated them. This, plus several noise complaints from the previous night, meant they asked us to leave. Even one of my friends who was a lawyer could not convince them. We tried to rent rooms in other places, but it was impossible to accommodate ten guys on a weekend day at the cup in the shortest possible time. So we headed to the airport with our tails between our legs and boarded the red flight back to Sydney, arriving shortly before 11 p.m. We went our separate ways, but my two remaining groomsmen did not allow me to return to the apartment. Come on, Adam. It's still your weekend. You're not back at work until Wednesday, so come over to my place and we'll have some more drinks. I was a little tired of all this drinking. Drugs weren't my thing. Other guys swallowed pills, but I preferred to control myself. However, I knew the boys had put a lot of effort into this weekend, so I agreed. And we jumped in a taxi to head to Tony's house. My fiancé, Georgia, was having her hen night in Sydney. I tried to call her, but was not surprised when the call went to voicemail. I didn't leave a message because I was sure she wouldn't be able to read it until the morning anyway. Georgia moved in with me two months ago. Her lease was up. I had recently bought a two-bedroom penthouse in the city, so it was stupid for her to sign a lease for another six months. Her parents weren't happy about it, but we were getting married in three months. They were strict Catholics, but they liked me. And I think being the youngest executive at my bank to get $1,000 $1,000 bonus helped. Back at Tony's house, the guys must have gotten the upstairs and downstairs mixed up because half an hour later, they were both snoring in their lounge chairs. I went to one of the bedrooms and got ready to sleep. My phone beeped, signaling a text message. I was expecting something from Georgia, but I was surprised to see the number of the man who lived under my apartment. Give yourself some rest, motherfucker. For some of us, go to work tomorrow. I read the message, then read it again. It didn't make any sense. No one was home, so he must have sent it to the wrong number. I replied to let him know that the message had not found its intended recipient. My phone buzzed again with another message. Yes, exactly. Just take this jerk off and go to bed or shut her mouth. You must be very talented to write a reply while your fiancé is squealing so loudly. Now I was at a loss. He clearly thought he had the right number. What's happened? Luckily, I had a way to find out without moving an inch. My penthouse was renovated by the previous owner just three years ago. She was the daughter of a Singaporean billionaire who was attending graduate school at the University of Sydney. He was an overly caring father and insisted on installing cameras in the living room and bedrooms with remote access. When I signed the contract to purchase the property, the agent walked me through the system and set it up on my smartphone. I've only used it a couple of times. There's not much to see in the empty rooms. I logged in with my passwords and a menu loaded, asking which camera I wanted to view. I chose the living room, and the first thing I noticed were empty beer bottles, wine glasses, a hookah, and a bag of assorted pills on the coffee table. I turned the camera around and couldn't find a single person but there were pieces of clothing scattered in the living room. The noise was coming from other parts of the apartment. So with a heavy heart, I switched the camera to the bedroom to investigate. Moonlight streamed through the open curtains, illuminating the tangle of bodies on my bed. I heard a man's voice. I think I know this voice. It was the voice of my best man, Tom. He said that he missed her very much. And now they are finally together again. I missed you too. Tom answered a woman's voice. To my horror, I clearly heard the voice of my fiancé. Georgia, jerk, jerk, jerk. Things only got worse. My best man had love with my fiancé. 
and from what he said, it wasn't the first time. Then I heard another familiar voice. It belonged to my friend Carl. God. They had love in a threesome, and I clearly heard what they were talking about. They were discussing me. I continued to listen and watch this disgustingly sexual act. What the heck? My best man and my boyfriend had love with her. I sank onto the bed, unable to believe it, but it was right in front of me. My ex fiance was a fool, and my supposed friends were horny studs. I wanted to crash, burn, and then bury these bastards. But as I learned from my business dealings, I needed leverage and a plan. If I was going to hurt them as much as they hurt me, I had to take my time and do it right. I went back to the security system menu and checked that it was recording. There were 24 hours of recordings stored on the hard drive, which were deleted if they were not downloaded. The lighting wasn't very good with clouds blocking the full moon, so the video wasn't clear. It's good that Tom and Carl were such great experts. They talked a lot about how they had love with her before, about places, positions, and Georgia answered. So I had a lot of hard facts about their misbehavior. I watched as Georgia stood up and went to the bathroom. The guys went to the kitchen, drank drinks, and returned to the bedroom. Returning to the room, they stretched out on the bed and continued talking. Then I received even more good information for myself. Georgia returned to the room and lay down on the bed next to them. I want to have love with you when you're in a wedding dress, Tom said. I won't receive it until the day before, so you'll have to wait until your honeymoon, answered Georgia, who always thought ahead. In no case, we're talking about a wedding day. Carl picked up. And how are you going to do this, naughty boys? Georgia said, laughing. I was with Adam when he paid for the reception at the hotel. The ballroom where the reception will be held has a band room on one side. The guys will take turns distracting Adam while the others entertain you. Explain, Tom. That smug freak. All four. Would you like it to be different? Carl grinned. I think. No. You know, I won't take birth control then. Adam wants to have children right away. You guys will play Russian roulette, and then we will see who our child will be like. How could I be so blind? Calm down, Carl. We have the whole night, and almost all of tomorrow. I won't pick up Adam until five in the evening, Georgia said. Come on, don't fool us. Get down to business, girl. You know you want this. She did not resist. And soon, the only sounds were her groans and the moans of the guys. Then, Georgia screamed. I had never seen her so animated. It is not surprising that the neighbor guy from the bottom floor was furious at the sounds and screams. I left the security system. I've seen enough. The hard drive located in a hidden cabinet behind my wardrobe continued to record everything that happened. I lay down and tried to work on my revenge. Inspiration wasn't coming, so I got up and went into the living room. Tony and Jeff were still snoring, Tony lying with his legs spread out. It took a lot of willpower not to wake them. I grabbed a beer from the refrigerator and was leafing through an old newspaper on the kitchen bench when I noticed the headline and inspiration struck. Police warned against alcohol consumption. It turned out that there were several cases of assaulted of drunk girls. The police feared that there was a group of men who attacked drunk and young women, followed them home, then broke into the house and committed gang assaulted. They urged women to be more careful and keep an eye out for their friends. They also asked for any information that could help them find the criminals. While I was wondering how to use this to my advantage, my phone buzzed again. It was my downstairs neighbor who said he had filed a noise complaint with the police. Great. I returned to the bedroom and immediately called the police. You've called the New South Wales police. How can we help? My God, you must get to my apartment. My God, I think my fiancé is being assaulted. I was as hysterical as possible. Calm down, sir. Can you tell me some details? How can I calm down? You must send someone there immediately. Why do you think this is happening, sir? The girl remained surprisingly calm. My neighbor complains about the noise, but I'm not there. I'm here. How can I make noise with my fiancé when I'm here? Please, please send someone. Please. How do you know that your neighbor complained? The girl asked again dispassionately. This will be more difficult than I thought. He sent me a message complaining and then sent me another message saying he had filed a noise complaint. Please send someone. I beg you. What address was indicated in the noise complaint? 
It was worse than talking to a call center or one of those computer voices. I told her my home address. Please wait a minute. Half a minute later, she returned. I'm transferring you now. Another thirty seconds, then a man's voice. This is Detective Sergeant Potts from the Love Crimes Unit. May I ask who is calling? Thank God. Finally. I'm Adam Spencer. Please send someone for my bride. Something terrible is happening. I pretended to start crying. We have a unit in the area. We just have to be sure of something. Don't get me wrong. But the noise complaint mentions that the noise was sexual in nature. Is there a chance that it's someone else other than your fiancé? Or that she might have someone else up there? Whining didn't work. It's time to see if losing my temper will work. We're getting married in three weeks. What do you think? If she suffers in any way because of these delays, I will sue you and the department. I will be on every television show. Write to every newspaper and use your name. Calm down, sir. We'll check it out. What is your bride's name? And what was she supposed to do tonight? I did some preparation for this question. Georgia. She was going with friends for a hen party in King's Cross. The newspaper said that the rapists seemed to be targeting the area. Okay. Like I said, there's a unit in the area, and they're going to look in. Are you calling from your mobile? We need the number so we can keep you updated. Yes. Should I go there too? No. Please stay where you are until we contact you. With these words, he disconnected. It didn't go as well as I had hoped. I wanted them to storm in and raise heck. I doubted that the assaulted would go away. I would have to explain. Nothing happened for twenty minutes. Then my phone buzzed with another text message. It was from my neighbor downstairs. Sorry, dude. I thought it was you there. The police are already rising. Guns, helmets, and crap. I hope Georgia is okay praying for you both. Crap. They bought it. I logged back into my security channel. I had to see this when I turned on the camera in the bedroom. I couldn't believe my luck. Tom and Carl used a couple of my work ties to tie Georgia's legs and arms to the bed frame. She liked it, but their perverted game could lead to disastrous consequences. I couldn't look at it. I switched to the living room and moved the camera to the door. No action yet. Georgia started screaming loudly again. Hopefully, this will strengthen the police's resolve. After three minutes I thought, my neighbor must be tricking me. Then, the door slowly opened. Two officers wearing bulletproof vests and pistols drawn entered the house, searched the living area, then gave a signal, and four more came through the door. The love was noisy, and they could clearly hear the action taking place in the next room. So they started moving towards the bedroom. I returned to the bedroom camera to find Tom and Carl still having love with Georgia. They were completely unaware, and then all heck broke loose. The police burst through the door, guns raised and flashlights on, and then loud screams. Armed police get down on the floor. Fast. Get down. Tom and Carl didn't know what was happening. Carl turned to meet the enemy's onslaught and resist. The policeman kicked him in the chest, causing him to stagger. Tom must have not had time to orient himself to what was happening, because despite all this chaos, he continued to study with Georgia. That was until another police officer grabbed him by the hair and pulled him to the floor next to an exhausted Carl. This is the scene. Carl and Tom are on the floor bare. Two police officers sit on their backs, cuffing their hands behind their backs. Bear Georgia is tied to a bed surrounded by strangers with guns. One of the policemen covered her with a blanket and began to untie her while they lifted Carl and Tom to their feet and began to lead them out the door. The boys finally found their voice. What the heck is this? Tom shouted. This will be the last girl you see for a while, you screwing perverts. You'll be the ones getting assaulted wherever you go. The policeman growled, pushing Tom towards the doorframe. It wasn't assaulted. She screwing loved it, Carl added. But he probably regretted not doing it, because another policeman hit him in the stomach with the butt of his gun, causing him to fall forward on his face. They led the guys out of the room. A policewoman came in and took charge of Georgia, who was freed and wrapped in a blanket, having sat down on a chair by the window. She began to speak quietly, calming the confused Georgia. It's okay now, Georgia. You're safe now. The senior sergeant will call your fiancé and ask him to meet us at the hospital in the hospital? Yes, we will check you. Do you want your mom to be there too? 
There was a great team at the hospital to help you through this difficult time. They have extensive experience working with assaulted victims. Georgia looked like a rabbit caught in the headlights of an 18-wheeler. Assaulted. Assaulted? She stuttered. It's okay, honey. They can't hurt you now. Just take your time. The paramedics will be here soon. It will be very interesting. Will she scream assaulted? Will she try to lie? The pressure on her will be enormous. Or she will say that everything was consensual and show herself to be a fool. Everyone in this room will know that she is engaged and getting married. I switched the camera to see how Tom and Carl were doing. They were already sitting in their shorts. A plainclothes policeman asked them various questions, but they did not say anything. Let's guys, let's deal with you. We found a large number of different pills here. Perhaps these are narcotics, and there are a lot of them here. I think you have exceeded the threshold for personal use and have moved into the dealer category. This gets you at least three years in prison, and that's without assaulted. All we are saying is that it was not assaulted. After that, we exercise our right to silence and wait for our legal representative, Tom said in his most formal voice. Help us now. Tell us everything we need and we can all sleep, said the policeman. The boys sat with stone faces and were silent. Okay, let it be your way. The policeman turned to the other officers. Get them in the van, take them to the station, and let them make one phone call. Armed officers picked up the boys and led them out the door, and another officer walked to the bedroom door and commanded the female officer to leave. They huddled close to each other and spoke quietly so that I could not make out what they were saying. After they stopped talking, she went back to Georgia, and the other guy took out his phone and called. My phone started ringing. Hello? I tried to make my voice sound as anxious as possible. Mr. Spencer, this is Staff Sergeant Potts. What's happened? Have you found Georgia? Is she all right? What should I do? My verbal barrage was interrupted by the sergeant. Calm down, Mr. Spencer. We have found your bride. She will be taken to the hospital soon. My God, is she all right? Yes, this is just a preventive examination. I will tell you more detailed information at the hospital. We should be at St. Vincent's Hospital in about ten minutes. Call me when you arrive, and I'll find you and give you the details of our operation. Before I could add another crazy answer, he hung up. I called a taxi and left Tony's house. It all worked out better than I could have hoped but I wasn't sure how the police would handle the situation. Will they believe Georgia or Tom and Carl? I'll have to be on my guard to keep this pot from boiling. A constable's met me at the hospital and led me through the emergency room to a room off to the side inside. A tall, thin man with a large hooked nose was talking on the phone. The constable told me to wait, stuck his head through the doorway, and told the man that I was here. He ended the call and hung up, then walked to the doorway with his hand outstretched. First Sergeant Potts, he said, shaking my hand. Adam Spencer, where is my fiance? She's with the doctor now. You'll be able to see her soon. I would just like to talk to you before you see her. He pointed to a chair at the table, moved to another, and sat down, clearing his throat. He continued. Tonight, five armed officers entered your apartment and detained two men who had tied your fiance to your bed. They were involved in sexual relations. We took them to the police station, and they are currently being interrogated. Your bride, Georgia, I interrupted. Currently, Georgia is under the supervision of medical personnel. Samples and readings are being taken from her. She should finish soon. In the meantime, I have a few questions for you to help us get the full picture. Is this really necessary? Of course. Georgia's well-being is most important now. I want to see her, I muttered. And you will, sir. But first, I need to clarify something. He ran his fingers through his thinning hair, then leaned forward and asked, Where were you this evening? Why is it important? I answered innocently. If you were at home, Georgia probably wouldn't be here now. It's clear. I was at a friend's house this weekend. I had a bachelor party. We got back late at night from Brisbane, and one of my buddies insisted that I stay with him and another buddy and continue to have fun. Where was it? I think in Renwick, or one of the nearby eastern suburbs. At what time did your neighbor contact you about the noise? I'm not sure. I'll check my phone. It should show the time of the message. I took out my phone and looked through the messages. At 11.45 p.m., 
I want to show you a couple of photos on my phone. They depict the men we detained. Please tell me if you have seen them before. Is this standard procedure? It's just a guess. These two don't fit the profile of rapists, in my opinion. They look more like young office workers. He picked up the phone and started scrolling through the images. I did my best to look stunned, then angry. What is it? A joke. Why do you have photos of Tom and Carl? Who are Tom and Carl? Tom is my best man. Carl is one of my friends. What do they have to do with this? These are the two bear guys we found in your apartment. Why weren't they at your party? They left Brisbane early. They had to work tomorrow. That's what they said. I sank into a chair and tried my best to look depressed. A voice came from behind me. Sorry, Mick. Can I have a few words with you? It was the policewoman I saw in my apartment. Could you step outside for a moment, please, Mr. Spencer? I stood up and headed to the door, leaving the phone on the chair. I set it up to record a conversation with the sergeant, and knowing what they were talking about could be very useful later. They talked to each other for a while, and then they both left together. I'll be back soon with your fiancé. Sorry, Georgia. I took out my phone, plugged in my earphone, and started listening to what they were saying. The policewoman began. We carried out all the checks and I wrote down a statement. But she hasn't signed it yet. What do you think about it? asked the sergeant. Well, that's why I didn't make her sign it. This seems a little strange. She definitely had love. But I don't think consent was an issue. Her story is similar to a TV script. Maybe we just caught her having her last fling before the wedding. I'm inclined to agree. The two guys arrested don't seem to fit the crime. They're cute jerks, but they're probably not rapists. We have enough drugs to keep them overnight. Her boyfriend? I can't tell for sure, but he looks like he's trying too hard to be shocked. How do you think we should proceed? Come with me and read George's statement. Maybe you'll remember what I forgot to ask. I've been a good cop. So before we get her to sign, you might want to have a conversation with her about the penalties for perjury. Fine. How tough can I be? Could she lose her temper? We're talking about someone who is a potential victim, even if we're not entirely sure. That's what I think is wrong with her. I don't think she's injured. More likely, she is truly guilty. Or perhaps just worried about being caught. I think you can scare her and get a real story. Then let's go have a look. There was a creak of a chair as the sergeant stood up. Then there was silence until I stopped the recording. I sat there wondering what Georgia would do. I looked at my watch. It was time to set the wheels of revenge in motion. I looked through my phone's contact list, found a number, and dialed it. Harold says Eric Town. Eric wrote in the business section. He was in charge of a dirty little gossip section called CBD. No one admitted to reading it, but everyone did. I met him at a political fundraiser, and we became friends. Hello, Eric. This is Adam. How are you? And what are you doing at such an inopportune, how are... It's a long story that I'll tell you later over a beer. But I just wanted to know if your column is ready for tomorrow, I asked. Hopefully. Just... Just... I hate the start of the financial year. It's always terribly quiet on the gossip front. Did you hear something I should know? His interest flared up. Isn't it too late to talk about this? It will be too late if you don't tell me right now. He always got impatient if he thought he was missing out on some important story. Would you be interested if two young geniuses aspiring to get on the board of directors languished in an interrogation room on drug and sexual assault charges? Heck yes. This would be the best gossip I've had in weeks. Can I use names? Please tell me I can use names, Eric begged. If you want to be sued, you can use names. This will be strictly in the guess who don't sue category at the end of his columns. Eric included a section called Guess Who Don't Sue which contained all of his unfounded, juicy notes without names. Every morning during the tea break in the city, small clusters of office workers tried to attach names to these accusations. Nerd. Now you know how I work. I need some backstory so I can come up with my cryptic clues. Spit it out, Brother Tom and Carl, I said, trying to keep my voice. Even your best man and groomsman. Are you shopping for your buddies? Who did they attack? To your mother? My fiancé. Or better yet, my ex fiance I tried, but I couldn't help feeling bitter. Eric was silent. Something in his reaction was not what I expected. Did you already know about this? I asked. No, 
but I guess I should say that I'm not entirely surprised. He said carefully, What is this supposed to mean? I raised my voice and received a stern look from a passing nurse. Well, for some time there have been rumors about Georgia and her boss. I couldn't figure it out, so I didn't talk about it. She also has love with her boss. I screamed a little again. Well, probably. But the story was that it was offered as an incentive to potential clients. Eric said bashfully, Damn it, how could I be so blind? It's called love, Adam. Anyway, do you want me to explode? That's why I called. I want to take revenge for a change. Consider it done. We said goodbye and hung up. A policewoman was walking towards me along the corridor. She had a very good figure and walked confidently. These women are in uniform. She stopped in front of me. I'm Constable Haven. I work with victims of sexual assault. Do you mind if I talk to you? Georgia will be here soon, and hopefully I can help you both overcome this trauma together. Hardly, I thought. But I put on a smiley face and let her advise me. It was a little tiring until she squatted down to get a better view. But mostly, I just stared at her. Georgia came up to me, along with Sergeant Potts. I stood up and pretended to be a concerned future husband walking up to them. I took Georgia by the hands. She started crying, and I stroked her back and head like a sad puppy, making comforting remarks about how everything would be fine, that I would be there for her and stuff like that. In the back of my mind, I was making plans. I had three wedding party members in trouble, but still had two left. Both police officers gave me their business cards, and we left on the way home. Georgia sat, snorted, and thanked me. She told me how wonderful I was and how much she loved me. Back at our apartment, I started to clean myself up. Georgia seemed eager to get me into bed, but there was no way I was going to get the sloppy fruits of that jerk. Who knows how many times I've already done this. I made a mental note to check with a doctor. Come on, baby. I need you to hold me. Georgia moaned. I just want to clean myself up. Go to bed. I'll be there soon. Fatigue must have gotten to her because she gave up and went to bed. I had a lot to do. First, I downloaded the video from my hard drive and watched it. It was perfect. From the moment they entered my apartment, it was obvious that no assaulted had occurred. Georgia couldn't wait to get bare and get into some sexy action with the guys. One count of filing a false complaint. Maybe if the prosecutor was delighted with the perversion of justice, the guys were more interested in getting high, and their big and long tongues helped me again. They said they took the drugs from Tony. I knew he always had drugs, but I didn't know he was a dealer. This is another groomsman with drug charges. Later, they went even further. Georgia asked why they had so much, and they said that Tony had just made a big purchase. He needed some extra money, and they lent him some. They were hoping to double that in the next couple of weeks as Tony moved stock. Slap, slap. Three charges of possession with intent to distribute. They might find enough good lawyers to stay out of jail, but their business careers were in jeopardy. After that, the three of them got down to business, and I still needed to find something on Jeff if he was involved. I originally thought I would email the CCTV footage to the police around noon, but given that the sergeant is not being very nice to me, I decided to call now. I thought that at 3 o'clock in the morning, I would just give them a message, but that would show that I wasn't trying to hide anything. I dialed the surgeon's number first and was surprised when he answered. Hello, Staff Sergeant Potts. He sounded annoyed. I hope I didn't wake him. This is Adam. Adam Spencer. I met you at the hospital when I picked up my fiance. Didn't I wake you? No, of course not. I have a night shift. I don't go to bed until 8 a.m. His mood did not improve. Listen, I don't want to take up your time. But my mom... I paused, as if trying to restrain myself. In my apartment, there are three CCTV cameras connected to a hard drive. I snorted and cleared my throat. I had to try and sell this. Yes. This interested him. Why didn't you say anything earlier? Did you see it? I could almost see him suddenly, sit up straight, leaning forward expectantly. I guess because of everything that was happening, I forgot. I... I... I have it. I paused again and blew my nose. Sorry. It's difficult. You know, I looked at it and maybe... And I stopped completely. And the sergeant took the bait hard. What? What did you see? Adam? Adam? Are you still there? I... I don't think it was assaulted. They... My God. 
They came together, laughed and kissed. I let out a strangled cry and pretended to sob. Does this have something to do with drugs? demanded the sergeant. He already suspected that the assaulted was fictitious, but it seemed that he still wanted to pin the boys. I didn't look at it much after that, but they put them on the coffee table. I lied. I need to look at this tape. There are two powerful legal eagles here making a fuss about lawsuits. Can you send it to me? I think I can send it by email. Wait, I'll give you the address. We need to get it quickly. He gave me the address and hung up. I went to my computer and sent a copy of all the footage from the three cameras. I went to the spare room and tried to sleep, but could only toss and turn with my eyes closed. I could not believe that I had judged the character of my girlfriend and my comrades so poorly. Somewhere around five, my phone rang. Sorry, I hope you weren't in a deep sleep. It was Sergeant Potts, and his voice sounded much happier. I was in bed, but I'm having trouble sleeping, I said sharply. Yes, well, that's understandable considering the circumstances. Look, I won't keep you. Could we meet for a cup of coffee when I'm free at eight? There are several events that I want to talk to you about. Of course, I don't have anything planned. There was strong bitterness in my answer. There's a coffee shop in the Surrey Hills not far from the Oxford Tavern. Do you know it? Yes. Just don't go there. There are too many cops there. Yes, I guess there is. Okay. I'll see you at eight. He passed it out, and I started tossing and turning again, trying to sleep. I got up at 7 a.m. and took a shower. Georgia was still fast asleep, or at least pretending to be. I don't think she really wanted to talk to me until she had time to come up with a story. I flipped through the morning TV shows trying to find something to take my mind off the past 24 hours. The main story on the news at 7.30 soon caught my attention. Police from the drug squad carried out a pre-dawn raid in the coastal suburb of Bronte. A search was carried out in the two-story house, and two men were detained in connection with an intra-city drug ring. Neighbors of the house said that the tenant was a pleasant young man who worked in one of the city's banks. Police are yet to release any further details, but have confirmed that a large quantity of drugs has been seized. They have also detained other people who they hope can help them with their investigation. Yeah, fudge you bastards. Sergeant Potts would be pleased. I got dressed and was about to go out to meet the sergeant when I remembered my conversation with the gossip columnist. I went back to the computer and checked the online add-on at the bottom of the CBD column under the bold heading. Guess who didn't sue? Some high-ranking PR expert and well-known girl in the city postponed her upcoming wedding after she was caught in flagrante delicto with a couple of wedding groomsmen. Unfortunately, her ex-fiancé and a rising star in the world of private banking was not among them. Amazing. That would have the customers in town chatting wildly at the water cooler this morning. Suddenly, I thought about George's parents. They were very good people and didn't deserve to hear about the upcoming problems secondhand. I called them immediately. Jack, George's father answered. Hey, Adam. How's the bachelor party going? It ended early after some beef in Brisbane. Can I meet you in Janet's this morning? What happened, Adam? I felt the trembling in his voice. I don't want to talk about this on the phone, Jack, I said softly. Is this connected with the morning newspaper? Jack worked in the city all his life and retired three years ago. He still reads the business section first thing every morning. I'll tell you later, Jack. Can you come to the city? They deserve to be told everything face to face. Okay. We'll be there around eleven. Where do you want to meet? He seemed resigned to the fact that he would receive bad news. How about that little bakery near your old office building? They still make the best cakes and treats around. Okay, I'll see you there. But that's it, Adam. Please don't make any hasty decisions until you know everything, Jack begged. I already know too much, Jack. I'm sorry. This time, I felt tears welling up in my eyes. For real. After saying goodbye, I walked out the door. It was a gorgeous, sunny in Sydney. Late autumn is always the best. The sun isn't as hot anymore, and the humidity is generally lower. I decided to walk to the meeting, which made a little late, but I didn't care. Sergeant Potts was about to leave when I entered the cafe. I thought you bankers were punctual. He swore. I'm still on vacation. I grumbled, sinking into the chair opposite where he stood. He sat down opposite me, his frown replaced by a smile. Luckily for you, 
We got the result last night. The CCTV footage was very informative. We couldn't use it as evidence, but it gave us enough information to work through them. We split them up, and when we started asking about buying a shipment of drugs, they both thought the other one was selling them. The waitress came over, and I ordered orange juice while the sergeant took warm milk. The police are not what they used to be. After taking a sip, he continued. We learned Tony's name from them. Then we raided that house and found even more drugs. The narcotics department was delighted. Tony was silent for a while, but when we shared what we had learned from the other two, he in. He tries to make a deal by giving the name of his supplier and what will happen to them now. The first two have been ordered to appear for a bail hearing tomorrow morning, and maybe Tony too, if he can work it out with the prosecutor. Public hearing? I asked. Hopefully. Yes, he chuckled. Their lawyers are trying to hold an extraordinary hearing. But the prosecutor wants the media to know about it, so it seems. Are you? He picked up the neatly folded Morning Herald from his lap, opening the CBD column. I... I don't understand what you're talking about. I tried to look innocent. It may very well be wondering if your CCTV system has remote access. He leaned back in his chair with a funny expression on his face. I would bet it also has a time map that lets you know what time it was checked. Maybe I should get a warrant and see for myself. Why chase the victim? Maybe by the time you get the warrant, the hard drive will be damaged. The sergeant's smile turned into laughter as he pulled himself together. He sat forward and spoke in a low voice. Keep your shirt on, Adam. You just confirmed my suspicions. I'm not interested in you, but I want to know what you want to happen to Georgia. What do you have in mind? Well, there may be a charge of giving false testimony. It certainly won't stick. I'm sure she can get it dismissed as a first offense. Or maybe we'll just forget about it. It's hardly worth spending time filling out paperwork unless you want retribution. And from the looks of it, you don't. He picked up the paper again to emphasize his point. I don't quite understand what you mean. I pretended to be a fool. Okay, you're a careful guy. Call me after six tonight if you want me to press charges. Otherwise, I'll bury him. He stood up and walked away, leaving me to ponder my choice. I finished my juice and walked out into the bright sunlight. I continued to walk towards the city. The next part of my revenge was to show up to work, disheveled and depressed. Humiliation wouldn't be fun for me, but I think it was one way to ensure that Tom and Carl's positions at the bank would soon become vacant. Upon entering the bank lobby, it all started with one of the security guards elbowing another and pointing in my direction. This continued as I walked towards the elevators. I got into the first one, and a few more people joined me. The postman rushed in with his car, just as the doors were closing. Apparently, he didn't read the business section of the Herald. Hey, Adam, how was your weekend? The secretary pretended to lose her balance and hit the postman's shins with the cart. Watch out, miss. The elevator stopped at the next floor, and he stepped out, still rubbing his shins for the rest of the trip. The others were silent. It suddenly seemed to them that the floor was very interesting to look at. I went to the top floor because I was hoping to see the general director, and by that time only the secretary remained there, who silent said the guy from the post office. Just before leaving, she put her hand on mine. I turned to face her. I'm sorry about what's happening, if you need someone talk to or cry with. Here is my number. She shoved a piece of paper into my hand and then walked away with exaggerated swagger, drawing attention to her killer legs and tight buns. I looked at the number. I didn't see her writing anything in the elevator, so it must have been written before I folded the note and put it in the nearest trash can. I think she probably had a whole stack of such notes in her pocket. I headed to the CEO's office. His secretary was a formidable woman with a sharp tongue. She sat at a high table and looked at people through glasses mounted on the tip of her nose. I walked into her office as she should. She lowered her eyes, ignoring the intrusion into her day. I waited for her to stop her task. I would earn her wrath if I spoke before she did. She raised her head like a cobra waiting to strike. But when she saw me, she softened. Adam, dear, what are you doing here? You still have two days off. I've never seen or heard her be even remotely conciliatory, let alone call anyone AI darling. I just wanted to ask if I could see Mr. Turnbull for a minute. 
I felt myself blushing at her sympathetic gaze. He's currently on a break between calls. I'm just finding out if this can be done. She slid out of her chair and walked over to his door, knocked, then poked her head inside to ask. I had never seen her standing, and she was quite short, which explained the high chair and table. She returned with a smile and said, Mr. Turnbull will call you now. Just sit down. She climbed back into her chair, and I sat down. She went back to work, then stopped and looked up again. She opened her mouth to say something, then stopped. I could almost see the wheels turning in her head as she considered what to do next. In the end, speech took over. I was abandoned at the altar. At least you found out about it in time. As soon as she said it. I think she regretted it before. I could think of a response. Her head bowed again, and she went back to work. Well, if I convinced her, then everything with the CEO should be simple. Mr. Turnbull came to the door and invited me in. He was a tall man with short curly hair that was graying at the edges. He kept himself in shape and was often seen running in the park during lunch. He returned to the chair at his desk and motioned for me to sit opposite him. Adam, I wasn't expecting to see you this morning, but under the circumstances, it might be better if we get the story from you today rather than later in the week. I sat in silence for a moment while Mr. Turnbull shifted uncomfortably in his chair. That is, if you want to tell me anything. Mr. Turnbull looked very nervous, which was unlike him. There was no point in delaying. I came to ask you for leave until the end of the week, since at the moment I am dealing with some personal issues. But since these personal issues concern other employees of the firm and the PR company hired by the firm, then I believe you have a right to know. Yes, otherwise I wouldn't have asked, Mr. Turnbull said defensively. I took a deep breath and cleared my throat for a moment, then began my clumsy work. Last night I returned to Sydney from my bachelor party earlier than planned. I was at one of my friend's houses when I received a message from a neighbor about noise coming from my apartment. At first, I thought he had the wrong number, but when he continued to insist, I called the police, thinking that someone had broken into my apartment and that Georgia might be in trouble. The police arrived and entered the apartment where they seized drugs and found my fiancé tied to the bed with Tom and Carl, having love with her. I stopped, took out my handkerchief, dabbed my eyes, and wiped my nose. Not that there were any tears, but it left the desired impression. God, God, muttered Mr. Turnbull, sitting forward at his desk, eagerly awaiting more. At first they thought it was assaulted. But after a morning conversation with the police, this version was rejected. Tom Carl and my other friend Tony are currently being held on drug charges. God. Not very good for the company. Not good at all. What did Georgia say about this? I don't know. I haven't spoken to her since I spoke to the police this morning. God. A terrible thing. A terrible thing. It's safe to say we won't let these two through our front doors again. You can stay as long as you like. Call me on Monday and we'll talk further. He leaned back in his chair, letting go of me, seemingly relieved. At that moment, the whole picture became clear to me. I walked to the door, glad that Tom and Carl would be out of work. I turned and asked a question. What about a PR firm? Immediately he again looked like a cat on a hot tin roof. Yes. Well, in this regard, an internal investigation will have to be carried out. Since Tom and Carl were in charge of the tender process, I'll talk to Jeremy, their CEO, and we'll figure something out. His face was flushed, and he was sweating. He was hiding something. Given what Eric told me about George's role in her firm, I also remember Tom and Carl laughing about Mr. Turnbull being actively involved in the tender process. I put two and two together and came to the conclusion that this was the other guy who had love with my fiancé. I left. He could wait. But now I realized that unless I launched a tactical nuclear strike, I would not be able to take revenge on all the guys who had love with my fiancé. I caught a taxi to the bakery where I was supposed to meet George's parents. I was early, so I ordered coffee, taking out my phone. I decided to log into the security system and see if Georgia had gotten out of bed. She sat in the kitchen drinking coffee and furiously texting on her phone. She got up and went to the bedroom. I thought to get dressed, but instead she put on her underwear and then her robe. 
A couple of minutes later, she was at the intercom, letting someone into the building. Most likely it was her parents. But why? And underwear? She rushed to the entrance, opened the door, and the fourth jerk was standing there. My second friend, Jeff Georgia, stood on her tiptoes trying to kiss him, but he dodged her and walked inside. I switched to the living room camera as they walked inside. He seemed to be trying to keep some distance between himself and Georgia. It was like two boxers in the ring checking each other out. Georgia was aggressively trying to back her opponent into a corner so she could land show shots while Jeff danced to the side. Jeff's advantage was that he could use furniture as a shield. Eventually, Georgia sat down in the living room, and Jeff took a position in the chair opposite. I couldn't hear what they were saying. Being in a busy public place, I couldn't turn on the sound. It looked like Georgia had turned on the water. Her head was in her hands, and her shoulders were shaking. Jeff couldn't decide. He stood there, then sat back down. But it became too much for him, and he moved closer to her and hugged her. She threw herself at him wrapping her arms around his neck and burying her head in his shoulder. I looked up and made sure that her parents had not yet arrived. But when I looked back, the scene had changed subtly. Her head was still pressed against his shoulder, but one of her arms was no longer wrapped around his neck, but lay on his lap. At this point, I felt a little sorry for Georgia. Obviously, she had a mental disorder. At that moment, there was a knock on the glass of the window, near which I was sitting, and Georgia's father waved his hand, heading towards the door, squeezing through the crowd of people waiting for their coffee. Jack made his way to the table. He was alone. I stood up and shook his hand. Then we both sat down. Your wife won't come, I asked. No. After reading the Herald, I thought it would be better if I came alone. Recently, Janice had high blood pressure, so I left her at home, he said, signaling the waitress to bring coffee. Yes, you're probably right. And now, Adam, that little slanderous crap has this article. I think you should sue him, Jack. Filing a lawsuit will cost a lot of money. It will constantly appear in the newspapers and is unlikely to be successful since it is true. What does truth mean? The waitress came with coffee, and he waited until she left. What do you mean? It's true. Last night, the police burst into my apartment after a noise complaint and found my best man and groomsman having love with Georgia in our bed. I said quietly. They must have forced her, drugged her or something. He tried to remain calm. At first they thought it was assaulted, but it turned out that it was not so. Don't be funny. This is ridiculous. My daughter would never do something like that. The calmness disappeared, and he almost began to foam at the mouth. I'm sorry, Jack, but the pictures don't lie. The wedding is cancelled. Nonsense. That was the first time I heard him swear. People fake photos all the time. Jack was a seeing-is-believing type. I didn't want to hurt him, but I wasn't going to be the bad guy. I took my phone and swiped the screen, opening the browser. I found the security feed again. Georgia was lying on the bed with one leg dangling. Jeff lay on top of her and tried his best. I turned the screen towards Jack. He studied it for a moment. This doesn't mean anything. Most likely, it was a staged performance with the actress. He placed my phone face down on the table. This is a live broadcast from my apartment happening right now. What kind of sick freak are you? I'm so glad Doris wasn't here for your crazy fantasies. When I tell Georgia she won't let you within three meters, he began to rise from his seat. You stupid idiot. Sit down and look. Jack! I shouted, causing everyone in the bakery to turn to us. He sat down with a stunned expression on his face. I know I've never swore in front of him before, let alone scolded him. Give me your phone. I continued. Now, Jack, he gave me his phone number. I looked through my contacts and found George's number. I pressed the call button, then turned my phone over, which was lying face down on the table. On screen, the action paused as Georgia reached for her phone on the coffee table. Jack turned the phone over, and before my eyes deflated, it suddenly became very old and fragile. I'm really sorry, Jack, but you should have known. I hope you don't lose too many deposits. But after three weeks, I'd say you will. You and Janice don't deserve this, but I can't go through with this. He cried, but didn't say anything. Just nodded. He wiped his eyes, collected his thoughts, and asked in a whisper, Have you already told her? No. 
She was sleeping when I left this morning for a meeting with the policeman in, of this case. Good God, she doesn't know that, you know. And she's with that guy again. This is not the same guy. Those two are accused of using drugs. No. He cried again. Come on, Jack. Let's get out of here and take a walk in the park. We both need fresh air. I left money on the table for coffee, and we left. We walked for half an hour talking about everything except Georgia. He had already calmed down and wanted to go home. So we went to the taxi stand. When are you going to tell her? Ask Jack when she has a free minute. It was hard not to be bitter. Jack turned away. Part of me still loves her, Jack. Part of me thinks this is a nightmare from which I will wake up and everything will be the same. That's what makes me feel so terrible. Because the rest of me wants to kill her. And all the men who touched her. You can let me know before you do, because I'll come and pick her up. Take her home. Tears appeared again. The father cannot stop loving his daughter. Yes, of course, Jack. I'll let you know. We awkwardly shook hands, and he got into the first taxi he came across. I turned and continued walking, contemplating my next move. I found a quiet place in the park and checked the CCTV footage again. The action stopped. Georgia was back in her robe and Jeff was tying his shoes. He really was a stupid jerk. He was engaged to the daughter of one of Australia's richest women. Penny Ryan Hill was the daughter of Jackie Ryan Hill, who, along with a Chinese consortium, owned three of the largest iron ore mines in Western Australia's Pilbara, as well as some of the richest gold and copper deposits ever discovered in Australia. She is now of the richest women in the world, with a fortune estimated at six billion dollars. Of course, Penny wasn't stunning, but she had large proportions. She was not obese, but she was very round. Her face had chubby cheeks that glowed bright red when she got tense or drunk, all topped off with a mop of curly red hair that could be described as unruly. Besides all that, she was a great girl, a lot of fun to be around, and she was in love with Jeff. You can get married in five minutes with more money than you will earn in a lifetime. That was one of my father's favorite sayings. I might not be able to accuse Jeff of anything, but I was sure that I could ruin his upcoming wedding if Penny looked at my security footage. Jeff also worked for her family company, so I guess this will end his job too. Thus, my revenge was quite assured, except for my boss. But I had a plan for this case too. I just needed to get George's cooperation and I think I had a thing or two to make sure she would meet my needs as I headed home. I was very interested to see how Georgia was going to handle our situation when I got home. Georgia was gone. I didn't expect it, but it delayed the impending confrontation a little. It also gave me time to make a video for Penny Jeff's conversation with Georgia. When he arrived, was also interesting. He was sent by Carl and Tom's lawyers to find out what she told the police. The charge of interfering with a witness came to mind, but that didn't make much sense. I'm sure Penny would come up with a much worse punishment. He continued to ask her about the drugs and what she told the police. She said she only told them about the assaulted. Jeff told Georgia that the boys were not accused of assaulted, but only of possession and trafficking of drugs. At that moment, she sank to the floor in the living room, and he hurried to console her. She now knew that the assaulted charge was useless and that was probably why she left the apartment. I was preparing dinner for myself around five in the evening when the apartment door opened. I heard the click of heels on the hardwood floor as Georgia and one of her bridesmaids, Shelley, walked into the living room. Apparently, the plan was to be safe. They saw me in the kitchen and headed towards me. As they got closer, Georgia opened her arms to hug me and said, Adam expensive, how are you doing? We were so worried. She snorted, as if holding back tears. I didn't return the hug, keeping my hands close to me. I tried to keep my voice even. I was busy talking to the police, my boss, and your father. Georgia tensed. She was caught off guard, but she held on bravely. Shelley came to explain that at a bachelorette party last night. My drinks were spiked, and I was kicked out of the nightclub. Tom and Carl were there and offered to take me home. And then they took advantage of me. She tried to hug me again, but I pulled away. Is it true? So what happened, Shelley? I said with sarcasm. Yeah. Like Georgia said, it was just a little fun that got out hand. And you spiked her coffee before she had love with Jeff this morning. That was amazing. 
Shelley's mouth hung open as she tried to process what I just said. Georgia took a step back as if I had hit her. She looked wildly between Shelley and me, trying to think of what to say. Shelley was the first to find her voice. You're on your own now, girlfriend? She hissed, turned, and walked to the front door. Georgia tried to grab her to hold her there, but Shelley pushed her away and hit her with a parting volley. I knew you were a party girl, but I didn't think you were such a fool. The door slammed, and Georgia and I were left alone. She turned to me again. Now she was crying. Well, it would be better to say sobbing. She muttered how sorry she was and how I should have stayed with her this morning. And this wouldn't have happened. Why does it always have to be someone else's fault? Will you just shut up? I shouted. Do you really think that I care about your excuses and lies? But I was drunk, and I was upset this morning. And that's only twice. I'll be good. Please. You really are a pathetic jerk. I took a long sip to finish the beer I opened earlier. Just twice. I tried to imitate Tom's deep voice. God, how I miss you. And then Georgia and I miss you too, Tom. And again, a shocked expression appeared on Georgia's face. But, but how? Clearly her tongue had been overworked the night before. Remember when you moved in? I told you about the security system and cameras. Yes. But you said you don't use them. I don't use it. But they still work 24 by 7. I thought the police might want a copy to prove you were rapid, but unfortunately, it only proved that you are a lying fool. Tears were already flowing for real in a continuous stream running down my face. She was squatting, leaning against the wall. She looked very pitiful, small, sad, and pathetic. Then I decided that I would ask the sergeant to forget about the charge of perjury, but I would not tell her about it until I figured out why she did it. If she even knew I walked, pulled Georgia to her feet, and helped her sit at the kitchen table. She tried to cuddle up to me, but I moved away took two beers from the refrigerator and sat down opposite her, opening the beer. I placed one in front of her and took a sip from mine. I want you to know we're done. Fine. She nodded her head. The cop wanted to know if I wanted him to charge you with perjury. I have to inform him about this before six in the evening. So you have half an hour to answer my questions truthfully, and I will tell him to forget about you. Please, Adam, don't need me. I interrupted her answer. My questions are, Wait for the police. She nodded her head, took the beer I had brought for her, and took a long sip. A friend in town told me that you slept with your boss. This is true. Georgia nodded her head again, wiping her tears with the back of her hand. And how long? About nine months. She answered, sobbing loudly. You were only there for ten. What the heck? I was recruited into a new strike group. We were supposed to become the leading link in promoting the corporate market. Georgia sobbed. My boss, Jeremy, called me into his office a month later. He was unhappy. She sobbed again. We applied for three corporate clients and lost each of them. Georgia stopped and drank more. Her sniffling was driving me crazy, so I reached over to the cupboard and grabbed a box of tissues, and she blew her nose loudly and continued. Jim said he didn't think I was making enough of a contribution to the team. I told him that I work harder than others. He walked around his desk and stood in front of me. He said that I was hired because of my considerable strengths and that it was time to show them off. He then started unbuttoning my blouse. Exactly. This is unequivocal sexual harassment. Why did you put up with this? That would be normal for you. You are a miracle child. The youngest guy to ever receive $1,000, $1,000 bonus. I was on my third job in two years. I wanted to make a statement. The tears were forgotten as her anger burst forth. Having love with your boss. This is one way to earn a reputation, but not a very good one. I did this, and it was I who was able to get three large accounts for them. I couldn't believe she was bragging about being a corporate fool. And now they'll leave you to your own devices, and you'll have to start doing stunts. For real? I don't think so. Jeremy wanted to play it safe, so I had to secretly record some of the meetings. I saved copies to cover myself. That was interesting. If I can get a copy of her and Mr. Turnbull, then I can punish this creep. Where do you keep copies? I asked, hoping it wasn't at work. On the desktop. At work? Darn, I exclaimed, slamming my beer can on the table. What's the matter? Georgia looked scared. 
I'd love to have a copy of you and Mr. Turnbull. I stood up and walked over to look out the window. I never. I don't. I turned around and directed my gaze at her. Well, how did you know this? She finally asked. Obviously you share your assets to get new clients. Our bank is a new client. Is that all you want? If you're so desperate to watch it, I'll just go to work and make a copy. Georgia shouted, standing up abruptly, causing her chair to fall. She stomped over to the table in the hallway and grabbed the keys. You won't even get through the front door, I told her. She stopped and turned to me. What do you mean? Your boss will cover his tracks. A guard will meet you at the door with a box with your things. They will never let you near the computer. Georgia bit her lip, something she always did. When in doubt, throwing the keys on the table, she turned to me and disappeared into the office. I walked to the door and looked inside, finding Georgia, sitting in my chair, loading the computer. I can access my computer remotely, she said triumphantly. I continued to watch as she dialed the access code, then repeated it, and then dialed it again. Her shoulders sagged as she realized I was right. She was blocked. Damn it. They blocked me. She sank back into her chair, apparently defeated, and then sat back down with renewed enthusiasm. There's a back door to Jeremy's computer that I used to put video files on. Yes, yes, I am inside. I moved behind the chair. Copy everything. I said you need leverage to negotiate severance, and most importantly, I needed to somehow ruin your boss's life. I walked out, leaving her, and about 20 minutes later, Georgia came out of the office grinning and waving a portable hard drive. Everything is juicy. Did you receive a copy of his incoming and outgoing emails? I asked. Hopefully. Yes, but I thought you wanted sexual materials, she said in a sultry voice. Continuing to approach me, I raised my hand. Stop. In the last 24 hours, I've seen enough of you in action to last me the rest of my life. I just want to be safe in case the bank comes after me, too. But I, I thought maybe we could. You and I. You know, like me. Try again. Sell everything. Move abroad. Start over from scratch. Unfortunately, there is nothing sacred about you, Georgia. When I saw you with Tom and Carl, I thought, well, maybe you were drunk. But today, with Jeff, you need help. But I'm not going to hang around here to see the results. She was crying again. I walked over to her and took the portable hard drive, then walked past her into the office. Georgia ran into the bedroom, and I heard the door slam. The hard drive turned out better than I had hoped. It turned out that Jeremy and Mr. Turnbull were old school friends. They sent each other numerous emails about Georgia and her talent, even starring in their own file with her as a threesome. However, this was not the most interesting thing. It turned out that they had conspired to defraud the bank. Mr. Turnbull wanted to top up his pension fund, so he forced Jeremy to inflate the tender price for a PR contract. He approved it, but Jeremy only recorded the required price in the company's ledger. They took the difference and divided it 50-50. I called Sergeant Potts, and he answered on the second ring. I thought you forgot, he said. I looked at my watch. 6.05 p.m. No, I just wanted to make sure I made the right decision. So... What's up? he asked, yawning. Don't bring a case against her. I think it will be unpleasant for her, even without this. Do you know anyone in the anti-fraud department? Perhaps, he answered cautiously. Why are you asking? I'll let you know later, I replied, dodging his question. I didn't want to reveal too much. God, he chuckled. And who this time will be on the receiving side? Let's wait and see. After saying goodbye, I hung up. Then I called George's father to come and pick her up. I wanted to sleep in my own bed tonight. I then downloaded a copy of The Morning Love between Jeff and Georgia and forwarded it to Penny, his fiancée. This turned out to be more difficult than I thought. I agonized over the submit button before clicking. It was mean to hurt, but hopefully keep her from doing more lately. Jack arrived about 40 minutes later. It took a while to coax Georgia out of the bedroom, but eventually she came out. I collected her clothes and they left. My cell phone rang. It was Eric from the newspaper. Did you like my column today? He asked, his voice full of enthusiasm. Yes, I answered, without much enthusiasm. Come on, we didn't chicken out, did we? I wanted to take revenge on them, but I heard others too. I thought about Jack and Janice in war. 
There is always collateral damage. Who do you want me to hit tomorrow? I thought about this for a bit. Are you still there? asked Eric. Yes, I was just thinking. He looked like a raven circling over a corpse, hoping for another feeding the two suitors who were caught with Georgia. And one more will be charged with drug crimes tomorrow. Sorry, buddy, but three bankers caught with a joint won't go through with the case, he said, showing his disappointment. Not charges of possession, but importation and delivery. I added, this is better. High-flying bankers. Eric laughed. Do you have anything else for me, buddy? Or have we already worked out this layer? I'll be in touch if I have anything else. I tried not to talk about it. I'd had enough for today. I turned off my phone, unplugged my landline, closed all the blinds, and tried to get some sleep. At 9.30 the next morning, someone knocked on my door. I got up and went to answer. It was Greg, the building's caretaker. Adam. Dude, what's wrong with your phone? I tried to call you. I just turned it off. I wanted to get some sleep without interruptions. What's the matter? I said irritably. These guys have been waiting downstairs for an hour to see you. He stepped back, and I saw one guy in a security uniform holding a box and another in a suite. A guy in a suite was holding a sheet of paper in his hands. Mr. Adam Spencer? Yes, I answered. I'm from the bank's legal department. I'm here to tell you that your contract with us has been cancelled under Section 112. That is, you have embarrassed the bank. You are hereby resigning. I have a severance check equal to two weeks' salary. And James has removed the personal effects from your desk. He handed me the check, and the guard put the box on the floor. I was stunned. They were already halfway back to the elevator when I came to my senses. Wait a minute. I signed a new contract three weeks ago, which guaranteed me nine months' salary, plus 50% of my last bonus. I shouted after them. I don't know anything about this, sir. If you want to deal with the bank, I advise you to contact a lawyer, the suit said, and then followed the guard to the elevator. The building manager shrugged and followed the others. Sorry, buddy. I picked up the box and carried it inside. It only contained the contents of my desk drawers and a few photographs. I wasn't going to let these freaks get away with it. I called a lawyer who reviewed my recent contract before I signed it. As I understand, your new contract came into force immediately. But you know the legal documents. You can challenge any option. Have you already been paid? He asked. Hopefully. No. The money should arrive in my account this Thursday. I answered. Well, that's why they're trying to do it then. They want you to fight for them. How do you want to deal with this? I can start the trial now, and we can get a preliminary hearing later this month. Darn, lawyers. Is there a way to get some personal time in the office with my boss before then? I have something that might change his mind about their position. This isn't illegal, is it? He asked. No, I didn't do anything like that. Is anything missing from the box that you usually kept in the office? No, wait a minute. I have a set of golf clubs in the closet next to the executive dining room. Great. How much do they cost? About 20000 I said casually. Nonsense. Are they gold-plated? Not platinum, but with gold accents. Nice set of Honda clubs. Well, half a set. A complete set costs about 50 A lawyer whistled. I'm starting to draw up an order to allow access to them. Can you finish by one o'clock today? I wanted to strike back right away. I don't know. It doesn't give me much time. And I have other things to do. Meet me at the entrance with the order and I will give. You? The golf clubs? I interrupted. Heck yes. See you there. I ate breakfast and headed to the office to prepare for the afternoon confrontation. Mr. Turnbull was always in the executive dining room between 12.30 and 1.30 p.m., so a commotion outside was sure to attract his attention. I couldn't resist checking out the Herald's website first to see what Eric had written. He inserted his witticism about high-flying bankers, and there was also an article, The Cancellation of the Engagement of the Heirs of $1,000-$1,000-$1,000. I didn't mention Penny and Jeff. I wonder where he got that from. One clock came quickly, and I waited on the platform in front of the bank building. The lawyer was five minutes late in approaching me, took a document out of his pocket, waving it like a trophy. I had to wait until the magistrates finished their morning sessions to sign it, but here it is. What does allow me to do? I asked as we headed to the front door. 
I was hoping for public access, but the guy played hardball, and that only allows you to go in and pick up your golf club straight inside and immediately go out. I hope that's all I need. We were already at the front door inside the security guard who had returned the contents of my office earlier that day. Move to stop me. Sorry, sir. I was asked not to let you into the building. He stood in front of me and motioned for two other guards to help him. I held the legal document in front of his face. This is a court order allowing me access to the building. Please move out of the way. I tried to pass by, but he was still blocking my path. I have to check this first. He took the ruling and spoke into the microphone attached to his shoulder. A couple of minutes later, the elevator doors opened, and the same little butthole who talked to me this morning stepped out. He took the court order from the guard, put on his reading glasses, and quickly flipped through it. Someone's had a busy morning, he said, looking up from his papers. This only allows you to go to the storeroom and back without any detours. He gave me the order back, and then turned to the guard, escort him to the executive's closet then come back here and throw his butt out onto the street. After that, he simply turned around and walked back to the elevator. I moved towards the elevators on the left, holding the guard over shoulder. I grabbed my clubs in the storage room, and then when I returned to the hallway, it was time to make a scene. Some jerk, my hockey stick. I dropped my clubs and headed down the hallway toward the executive cafeteria. You can't go there, sir, the guard said, grabbing my hand, but missed. I rushed towards the dining room, but the guard was faster than I thought. He grabbed me just as I approached the doorway. I tried to free myself, but he was stronger than I thought. Hearing the noise, Mr. Turnbull appeared at the door. What the heck is that noise? He shouted, and then realized who it was. What the heck is he doing here? Sorry, sir. He had a bench warrant, the guard said, lifting me off the floor. My collar. I stopped resisting as my victim was right in front of me. Mr. Turnbull, I'm glad to see you too, I said with sarcasm in my voice. I thought you might want to reconsider my severance package. Never, he pointed at the guard. Get this nonsense out of here now. I took the flash drive out of my pocket and threw it to him. Better look at this when you have the opportunity, but not when your wife is nearby. Mr. Turnbull's eyes narrowed. What are you talking about? Call Jeremy and he'll tell you. I spat how to get him out of here. The mention of Jeremy's name did not frighten him. Apparently, he decided that this issue had been resolved, putting the flash drive in his pocket. He returned to the dining room. The guard started dragging me down the corridor. You have 24 hours. I think you have my mobile number. I shouted towards the closing door. On the way back, I grabbed the clubs. The guard did not let go of my hand until I was back on the landing in front of the house. My parasite. Sorry. My lawyer was waiting and took the clubs from me. I was happy enough if I got the deal. I signed up for three weeks ago. I could buy another set. I got a little worried when I didn't hear anything before I went to bed at 11.30. My phone signaled that a message had arrived. Meet at the Centennial Park Coffee Shop at 6.45 a.m. Gotcha. The next morning, I arrived at the park at 6.30, hoping to be there first. Apparently, Mr. Turnbull had the same idea as I walked on one side, and he walked on the other. We came together awkwardly, keeping about three meters away from each other. What file do you want? he asked angrily. Only what is due to me under the new contract. I supported his anger. This contract was not valid until Thursday. This is a controversial fact, and I do not have time to carry this conversation through our court system. I never thought that you were a blackmailer he growled, his face turning red. I never took you for an butthole who has love with his employees. Fiancé, I answered. We stood scowling at each other until Turnbull backed down. Okay, but I need the notes and all the copies you have easily. You will receive the records when I have a signed document from the bank confirming my legal rights. You will receive it today. He turned to leave. And one more thing. I want the little screwing legal eagle you sent yesterday to bring the documents. It will be fun. Anything else? He asked with sarcasm. No, that's all I want. I smiled. He walked away a little and then came back closer. This time you know that you will never work in this city. No. Let this country be. Never again. You little jerk. He hissed. It was a pleasure doing business with you. I said with a laugh as he left.
I still had the emails between Turnbull and Jeremy, and will be passing them on to the fraud department as soon as the money hits my bank account. The next couple of days passed relatively calmly for me the next morning. Shitty little legal eagle from the bank was on my doorstep with some forms for me to sign. He left me a copy and said the money would be paid on Thursday. I gave him an envelope with a flash drive and a small portable hard drive, and he walked away with his tail between his legs. Jack and Doris arrived Thursday morning and took the of Georgia's belongings. They had some problems with Georgia. She got drunk and went to her boss's house to confront him in front of his wife. They called the police who warned her to go home and then picked her up for drunk driving. She drove at high speed and lost her license on the spot. Tom, Carl, and Tony were released on bail, but the prosecutor later acted like a hard butt. He went on morning television with an article about drugs in the corporate sector. He did not mention specific details, so as not to jeopardize, but the conclusion suggested itself, especially when on the hour-long news, three guys were walking out of the courtroom trying to hide their faces. Jeff seemed to disappear from the face of the earth. I talked to Eric, and he said there were rumors that he was sent to some South American hole by pennies. The company was exploring for minerals there, and the natives were not happy about it. It was rumored that white men could not live there for more than six months without being kidnapped or killed. Thursday afternoon at 4.55 p.m., my bank account was $720,000 higher, and at 4.59 p.m., I was on the phone with Sergeant Potts. The next morning, two detectives from the fraud department and a guy from the investment and securities department came to see me. I showed them the emails. They claimed it looked like a conspiracy to commit fraud. Then came the important question. How did you receive these letters? I had to admit that they were not obtained legally. The detectives were a little angry, feeling like they had wasted their time. We know all these big guys are running scams, but they are surrounded by big legal fences. We can't drag them here and force them to tell their story. The guy from the securities department wasn't so concerned. Calm down, guys. We consider these letters as pointers. Where to look? It will take some time, but there will be a paper trail. It's better for us to forget that we even saw this correspond, since I don't want to jeopardize any charges. They left, and I was left alone with myself. Mr. Turnbull seems to have started a rumor about me. I contacted competing banks with a job offer, but the staff did not return my calls. I was walking down the street near my building, wondering what to do when a black car pulled up next to me on the side of the road. The window rolled down to reveal Penny Ryan Hill in the back seat. You look as lost as I feel. She said seriously, and then a wide smile blew mad on her face. I refueled the company plane and it's waiting on the runway. Do you want to rest a little? Mommy? Should I sit and feel sorry for myself or go on vacation? I thought, rubbing my chin. Give me five minutes and I'll pack my suitcase. To heck. Just sit down. Where we're going, you won't need a lot of clothes. And where will we fly? I asked, throwing caution to the wind and opening the car door to a family complex in Mauritius. It has its own beach pool, golf course, and chef. Go, I exclaimed as she reached forward and tapped the glass separating the front and back seats to signal the driver to go to the airport. Twenty-five minutes later, we were seated on the Rainhill family's Gulfstream plane and on our way. Three weeks turned into five months. A fantastic break. Did I hook up Penny? Of course, with a flight attendant, a maid, and half a dozen local girls. Penny was just a crazy girl. When she decided to have fun, it was an amazing sight. But that's another story. Why did I come back? It's very simple. I wanted a front row seat to Mr. Turnbull's fraud and racketeering hearing. He walked in at the start of the hearing, all sweet and easygoing, chatting with his team of lawyers. The bank supported him, so he had a lead and assistant barrister, two assistants, and a legal advisor. By the end of the first day, his tie was down, and beads of sweat appeared on his face as he spoke anxiously to his lawyer. Things weren't going very well. The prosecution was very thorough, and presented a long and complex paper trail that linked Mr. Turnbull to Jeremy and the ordeal. The defining moment came at the end of the day when it was revealed that Jeremy had surrendered the day before. He admitted he was wrong and was going to plead guilty to a slightly lesser charge in exchange for testifying against his accomplices. The bank, sensing the inevitable, 
withdrew its support. On the second day, Mr. Turnbull arrived at court, subdued, accompanied only by his legal adviser. One of the bank's legal departments made a statement in court that the bank was no longer providing legal assistance to Turnbull and intended to initiate proceedings against him to try to recover some of the funds. After the difficult events in the courtroom ended, the prosecution quickly closed the case when it was the defense's turn. She demonstrated her desperation by producing a hard drive containing photographs of Mr. Turnbull, Jeremy, and Georgia. They claimed that Jeremy blackmailed him into the plot after Georgia secretly taped him. The press rushed to the doors, taking out their smartphones, ready to call their editors with juicy gossip. This brought Georgia into a fight, and she was summoned to court. Jeremy also had to return to the dock. This entire sordid saga was played out in front of the media, and for a week it was the main topic of newspapers and television broadcasts. Mr. Turnbull's defense was in full swing until the prosecutor called Tom and Carl into the dock. They explained that Mr. Turnbull's enthusiasm for his old school friends predates the love tape. The defense tried to discredit them because they were serving four-year prison sentences for drug dealing. But what they said must have resonated with the judge. He concluded that there was a case to be made and referred Mr. Turnbull to court after the circus of the trial. Mr. Turnbull appeared to have lost his appetite for fighting, changed his plea to guilty, and received a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence. I'd like to say he ended up penniless and alone, but we all know those white-collar criminals are too smart for that. Shortly before his indictment, he must have been told that the securities people were snooping around. He transferred most of his assets into his wife's name, after which she began divorce proceedings. By the time of the trial, he was living in his son's garage and was declared bankrupt with no assets. Undoubtedly, after his release, there will be a reconciliation and he will be free again. The head of the Department of Public Prosecutions have enjoyed being the center of attention. So after Mr. Turnbull hesitated and admitted his guilt, he went after Jeremy and Georgia. Jeremy took the deal on the conspiracy to defraud charge, but the Department of Public Prosecutions admitted using a surveillance device to record private without consent, filming indecent acts and using a telecommunications network to facilitate the commission of a crime, extortion threats and sexual harassment in the workplace. Some of these offenses were only minor misdemeanors, but they all added up and he ended up getting three years behind bars. Georgia was given a suspended sentence for recording without consent and filming indecent acts. However, during all these trials, her face appeared in the news and her reputation was damaged. Some of the dirt stuck to me, even though I was only a supporting actor in the show. At various times, there were speculations about my involvement. Apparently, I was branded as an unbalanced cuckold in the financial sector. My job prospects improved. So if no one gives you a job you have to look for your own. I started a venture business specifically for environmental projects. I haven't made a fortune, but I'm surviving and hopefully doing good things. Penny and I remained close, but she was a player and I was not. I'm still searching, but I have trust issues that are holding me back. I've just started a project to rejuvenate some wetlands 700 kilometers west of Sydney in the real outback. Two mining companies and the bank have invested money to bolster their corporate image. I will be living in an old homestead that was once the main house, a 100,000-acre sheep station on the Darling River.